You're listening to a Meat Smith Harvest. This is the podcast that encourages and equips you to grow your home around the harvest. Welcome, Meat Smiths. This dialogue picks up where we left off in our last episode's conversation. You can find part one on our website, YouTube, or iTunes. If the content resonates with you, please consider supporting our team by going to patreon.com backslash meatsmith and donating a small monthly pledge. This goes directly toward more free media headed your way. Thanks for staying tuned for part two. Okay. And our mic is our mic's doing good. its thing. <laughs> yes, I checked about 18 times. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll say, hello everyone, welcome Meet Smith. Our mic is on, sorry about that last episode, it was a little crazy as I was setting up and we were integrating several new live feeds, so the actual mic that was recording for the official podcast wasn't on or something, I, don't, I still don't know, I'm putting it behind me. Brandon <laughs> is furiously looking up sausage in the OED the authoritative tome on the English language so so it's this right here this is the compact edition of the Oxford <laughs> English dictionary compact I like that two volumes it's like three inches wide yeah and it's really fun because it's incredibly brazen it dares to include every word in the English language can you show that ever uttered the just the font size itself okay. is it's well this amazing. is yeah so this is the compact version see what i mean it's ridiculous you, we can barely read can't it even in focus person. it yeah. but uh th- this is like the you know <laughs> the oed for dummies version they actually have one because they dared to include every word in the english language The English language is very fertile of new words, and so we're constantly birthing new ones. And so they release updates, um, appendices, or whatever they're called, annex versions, you know, to include new verbiage. This was started back in the day by the doctor, Dr. Johnson. And it was, I think it was kind of his brainchild, and then he had one guy who devoted a lot Oh, hi. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's like 12 de- degrees in here right now. Devote a lot of words. The primary contributor was a bit of a nut job, a bit of a crazy person. A madman, one might say. And Dr. Johnson was a professor. And you can find a book by that title called The Professor and the Madman, which is the history of the OED, of the Oxford English Dictionary. And it's just so delightful and incredible. It's an incredible story. And I think they're actually making a movie out of it right now. But you should read the book. Oh, that's exciting. And because it tells you what this thing is, and not only is it every word ever uttered in the English language, but it is the first usage of every word ever uttered, ever written. Written, not uttered, right? Right. Written. And then the second usage, and then the third. And I think it's like the first five uses. And so someone was combing through, you know, all of English literature, (laughs) several people, teams, but really there was one guy that devoted the most. And um, he was a bit of a weirdie. He ended up castrating himself. Oh my gosh, wow. Sort of like Occam, like Occam's razor. Uh Uh-huh. Different razor. (laughs) And, uh, you know, that words... Words can do that to you. But he was the greatest contributor, the madman. He, uh-huh. he, he found most of the... So anyway, uh, sausage. Oh, boy. <laughs> so it has many forms. It goes through all the forms, you know, uh, starting with... I mean, when I think of what the word sausage means, I know that salsus, which is the... Uh, where we also get salami is the Latin word for salt, and it's it's related to all you know that group of words pertaining to the saltification of meat. So S A L S U S. I think so. It's like the Latin. And then they and then but specifically like botulus. Botulus was the Latin word for sausage, mm-hmm. having nothing to do with the toxin botulism, which was. Uh, not discovered until the late nineteenth century, and then retrogressively named. Uh, borrowing the the Latin word for sausage, 
which is weird because all the first cases of recorded botulism had nothing to do with sausage, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it was pig blood stuffed in a stomach, pig stomach, and insufficiently cook it, or a undercured and um, warmly smoked ham. Those are the first cases of botulism. So nothing to do with sausage, which is interesting if you follow that out uh -huh. to the draconian warnings you get in your sausage books. Anyway, <laughs> so, you know, Middle English, sausage, wow, very same, same smelling. Um, old French, sausage, modern French, saucisse, like saucisson. Uh, and in the ridge, let's see. From the, so, oh, this is great. I love how they define this. This is the material cause right here okay. of sausage. Mm -hmm. In the original use. A quantity of finely chopped pork. So think about that for a second, right? Chopped. Before grinders. Right. And that uh, means work. Yeah. Work, work bells are going off in my head right now. We even <laughs> have documentation of monastic recipes for sausage uh. and the tools that they used. And they would use the intestines of animals as the casing, of course, but they would drape them over the gigantic key rings. This is when kitchen implements were oh. not so readily available at Amazon Prime Speed. Yeah, we didn't so have, they didn't have like four Gigantic yeah. keys mm -hmm. for monasteries. One side was a ring, which yeah. was pretty essential to, um, to the maintenance of the monastery, was yeah. the lockability of certain places. Well, like not to mention the books themselves. Exactly. Keeping your library locked up. Right, you know, so Aristotle doesn't disappear right. from the cosmos. And they would use the key ring as the like the stuffing horn you know they would drape the casing down and then its edges oh would be gosh. around the key the, the hole brilliant and they would stuff it instead of a funnel like, like we that have. that's yeah. right yeah mm -hmm. and then they then you can we do even have artifacts of funnels you know long narrow steel tinny type funnels with wooden rammers huh. before mechanical stuffers very tedious work but you know didn't stop anybody from making more diversity of sausage than we could even imagine today. Yeah. Our sausage is reprehensibly homogenized. Mm. In spite of the convenience with which we're able to produce it. Right. Interesting. Yeah. It's like an inverse purport, inverse yeah. relation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a converse of the obverse, inversely considered. <laughs> so it was finely quantity of finely chopped pork. I like that pork is the first on the list. Beef or other meat spiced and flavored enclosed in a short length of the intestine of some animal so as to form a cylindrical roll usually one of the links formed by tying the uh the containing intestine at regular interval intervals in the 19th century the application of the word what has been greatly extended in its widest use it denotes a preparation of comminuted, which is ground, as opposed to finely chopped, comminuted beef, veal, pork, mutton, or a mixture of these, either fresh, salted, pickled, smoked, or cured. There are more than 150 kinds of sausage distinguished by names indicating the ingredients and the method of manufacture. Pretty cool. So I want to get to the earliest uses of sausage in that sense just mm -hmm. described would be oh poloni no way crazy okay um getting distracted <laughs> i was gonna say uh right. 1553 <laughs> and keeping it in a certain pickle as we do regard our sausages as we do ragouts or sausages so that's from 1553, and that's more like Middle English. So No, not Middle English. That's uh, early modern English, like what Shakespeare would mm -hmm. have written in. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So <laughs> they used to preserve sausages in pickles. So sometimes you would put sausages in brines. I've read oh. old recipes about that, and they would do that with... Uh, Uncooked or cooked? Probably fermented, and, and I don't know. I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. not going to guess. Mm -hmm. But at least as we understand it today, 1553 seems to be the earliest use of meat in tube form. 1553? Mm-hmm. 
That's a little later, actually, than yeah. I would have thought. The first one is sometime in the 14th century. They don't know the exact date. Mm. Um, Was that just the word? Spelled S-A-W-S-Y-G-E. Of course. Sausage. Well, but that doesn't mean that the usage was that late in history, right? Like, it just means that the word wasn't used. Well, that is a long debate. What comes first, the written word or the verbal articulation thereof? And because codification of meaning is a little slippery until you start writing things down. But, Mm -hmm. you know, that's literary criticism stuff. Okay. Yeah. So what are we deriving from all of this? Well, <laughs> that the episode we have for you today is entitled Sausage. Right. And we wanted to uh, give it a little historical context. Uh, you know, I guess I was wondering, yeah. maybe the first part of this episode, we could talk about sausage as a general category, much like bacon yeah. is a general category, at least the way that we approach meat processing so just like bacon in in its historical context refers to actually any whole cured muscle like including the shoulder including the loin yeah you know i would i would guess and i wanted to run it by you if that sausage is a similar (coughs) plays a similar role that that uh it's not just what we think of as, you know, the breakfast links. But, like, there's a whole... I mean, there's blood sausage. Mm-hmm. There's andouille, which is, mm-hmm. like, sausage within a sausage. Mm-hmm. There's... I mean, like you said, there's... Some people today even don't really even use a grinder. They chop things finely. They don't even use a stuffer. They stuff with their hands, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, to me, it's this category of another way of preserving your meat and feeding a lot of people at once, you know? Yeah. uh, Rather than just, like, grabbing a little, you know, like the styrofoam packets at the grocery store with, like, four links in them each. Yeah. That's like the very modern form of sausage, but mm-hmm. historically it's been used in yeah. a multitude of ways. Does it that has. make sense to yeah. you? Yeah, and I think it's been... Uh, oh, boy. Oh. We have a, a man down out there. I'll be right back. We can. That's we what can. happens when you ice skate on a frost-covered deck I know. in it's, your it's soccer pleats. I'm going to walk off without, with my headphones. Um... Yeah, well, yeah, I I was going to say that I think that sausage, fresh sausage is a modern convenience that didn't exist. So I don't even know if before refrigeration they had the, such a distinction that we carry between preserved and fresh. Because for us, that distinction is more possible because we have fridges and freezers. But for people before, there was just sausage, and it was this thing that you made, and you could eat it at different times during its uh, after you made it. The sooner you ate it, the fresher it would be. And then it was more of just a duration. The longer the sausage hung out, the drier it became until eventually you could slice it and it would stay hard and dry, like wood, like what we understand today as salami. And so ultimately, pre-modern use of refrigeration all sausage was salami and all salami was sausage if you know what i mean and i think that the advantage of it was twofold it's that in the grinding and the chopping of little bits of meat you're able to actually apply the salt to every every little bit it's sort of Mm -hmm. like a way to impregnate the all of the meat with salt rather than, as with the whole muscle cure, just to the outside. Uh, and then hoping that it gets, you know, through the long process of recolization down to the inside. And so I think that there's a convenience built in to sausage for that reason. And then I can't get over, you know, the notion that it is pre-chewed. There's something about mm-hmm. sausage that is eminently comforting. It's already chewed up for you. 
you just kind of got to like roll it around in your mouth and then send it down. It's like mashed potatoes. Yeah, I mean, it is so, it just, it's already halfway uh, in your body before you've even put it in your mouth or something. It's just, it's so comforting in that way. Well, and I got to say, because you're salting every little mm-hmm. surface area inside the banger, mm-hmm. it's you can put anything in there and it will be good. Mm-hmm. So I say that pragmatically as a mom who's trying to get some good iron in her kids. Mm-hmm. And so let's put half a liver in this batch of sausage, you know, and yeah. it really will be delicious. But also just culinarily, it's not a dumbing down either. It's Mm-mm. it really, you can elevate any meal with a sausage that has, I mean, you can even put cured meat in sausage, Yeah. right? I mean, the sky is the limit. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, it's it's a perfect example of one of those things that I have to stop making negative absolute statements about. Oh, right. Because I get questions like that all the time. Does Do you ever blankety blank blank in sausage? <laughs> and if I'm stupid and I haven't heard of that particular thing, I say, no, no, we don't do that. And then inevitably, I read about, oh, actually, except for these people in, you know, uh, Eastern Poland that have been doing it for, I don't know, a thousand years. Yeah. So there's really, it, it's really amazing the diversity of ingenuity. You know, there are sausages that are made the day of the kill where by, and this is on an Anthony Bourdain episode from years and years ago. I think it's the, I can't remember. He was, he was somewhere in Central Europe, maybe Eastern Europe, mm-hmm. and they were doing a backyard pig killing and they cooked the meat. The meat was in a big pot simmering away. And then they got it out, chopped it all by hand, seasoned it. And then, oh yeah, the Eastern European method of stuffing sausage is just mind-blowingly skilled. It's so cool. Yeah. And they have these tables with three walls on them, you know, little uh, to prevent the sausage mash from spilling. So rather than a tub, it's a sausage table. Right. All the cooked meat is finely chopped on that table, seasoned heavily and deliciously. And then stuffed by hand into individual links. With, no funnel, no tool. You can't even describe it. You just have to see it almost. It's so incredible. With little, two little pumps of the hand, you can fill a sausage. And then those are plopped in the pot, back to the pot. Again, just to cook the casings or fry it up. And that is a cooked meat that is stuffed into a raw casing. Yeah. Um, it's just all over the place. And then you get something like uh, summer sausage, which... People have very fond memories of, you know, uh, it's very common for butchers to turn game into summer sausage. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you try to describe these varieties and you're like, wait, what exactly is summer sausage and what differentiates it from salami and from a fresh breakfast sausage, you know, and summer sausage is unique. Historically, it was a rapidly fermented sausage that gets real tangy and sour. And then it was smoked to a degree of cookedness. It was cooked. And then you would, so you do all that in the winter. And then you would eat it in the summer. Mm. That was your summer sausage. And today we associate summer, because then there's also the the other variability of what our sausages taste like today. Mm. And summer sausage today is sourly, very sour. Because uh, it's, it's mimicking that, bacterial fermentation that made it safe for smoking but the sourness today is that you just look at the ingredients list it's achieved by ascorbic acid mm. or and other cure ex- accelerators like sodium erythorbate which is why the meat you can't quite tell if the meat is cooked or raw in a summer sausage yeah. it's like this weird in between place and um but it's tangy because of ascorbic acid which is like a form of They call it vitamin C on on supplement labels. Like it's really, it's just very acidic. And so it is, the pH is lowered through the souring, the direct addition of um, acid in the form of ascorbic acid. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of sausage making ends up being this archaeological project because you can't, it's hard, you could, you could, but it's tricky to make that at home. You know, it's tricky to make something with sodium erythorbate. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could find <laughs> that ingredient online. And so we find ourselves trying to go back. Well, wait, didn't people like make these at home? Isn't that where all this came from? The answer is yes. And so it's a, it takes a little bit of archaeology to figure out how these different styles of sausage were made. 
Yeah, sausage shouldn't have to be that esoteric. Yeah. Um, for to the home um, meat processor. Yeah, and unfortunately, few items of porcine abundance that you can create have suffered more abuse than sausage at the hands of recipe books. Mm. Do recipe books have hands? On the pages of recipe books. Right. Sausage recipe books, it's just, they assume the lowest common denominator, which is meat that is totally flaccid, flimsy, and oily, and oxidized, and so prone to smearing through your grinder. And so they put you through this rigmarole of cubing the meat, partially freezing the cubes, freezing the grinder head, and then grinding the partially frozen meat into a bowl, sitting in another bowl that is full of ice. And then you have to mix this stuff while it is near frozen and your knuckles are aching. <laughs> and that's the only way to prevent the meat from totally breaking down. Um, and I should say I've made thousands and thousands of pounds of sausage. And I have never done that. Ever, ever, ever. Never. Well, I did it once. Once. <laughs> <laughs> By never, I mean once. Yeah. Because I was, uh, you know. Well, you the, needed to know. Well, the um, the 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 consensus is so total on re in recipe books when you read about that. Like that is the way to make sausage. Is there it, is no other option. American only, or would you do you know if other? I don't think Steve Lamb mentions it that way, yeah. and I'm pretty sure neither does. Hugh Fernley, Waiting Stall, and the River Cottage stuff. Jane Grigson doesn't. Yeah. It's just if an I American recall. thing. So I guess it is yeah. primarily American. And I think it is a response to our insipid pork supply, which if you put floppy meat in a grinder, it's going to come out as paste. So it's just kind of the way it's going to go. Whereas a pig you raise at home is going to have a higher quantity of unsaturated fat, or I'm sorry, saturated fat, which is structure means that the grinder, rather than smearing it, chops the meat. It's a chopper, um, which is a much better way to go. And uh, Well, yeah, so you wanted to try this method. Yeah. Because I think it, just a couple years ago, we were mm -hmm. dipping our pinky toe into maybe uh, getting a book deal. And oh, so yeah. you were writing a sausage... Mm. Uh, you know, proposal. Doing some tests. Yeah. yeah, you were running some tests, and you needed to know because every single authoritative book yeah. in, in American English um, has you go through this song and dance. Yeah. And so you were like, "Is it really necessary?" Yeah. And it really it took you three times as long. It really isn't. We did a we did a blind taste test. Oh, that's right. Remember? Yeah, uh -huh. I think we even had some friends uh -huh. do it with us. Yeah. And yeah, I remember, we no. actually didn't like it so we much. We didn't like it as much. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So not only did it take longer. <clears throat> yeah. It was uh, worse. Yeah. The final product was worse. It's like it it suffered so much more abuse. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't abuse. Yeah. Your links. Um, the meat. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't good. Yeah. It was drier which is that's weird. it it was drier which is exactly the thing that that whole rigmarole is intended to prevent right which is the what is it it's not the deep bonding that's not the right word but the excuse me the separation of the fat from the water mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the meat mm -hmm. from the lean uh-huh from the protein that's what i'm trying to say uh and the sausage will break and all that fat just cooks right out and runs into the pan and all you're left with is this rubbery you know, uh, textured, dry sausage. Yeah. And I have never suffered that because I've always um, made sausage from healthy pigs, from salubrious meat. That is just, that's the thing. It is effortlessly delicious. Which I think gets us to, like, the material cause of sausage. What is it? <laughs> right? What, Brandon, is sausage? So, I how, think... How do we make our sausage? Well, 
Yeah, that might be the efficient cause. But the what is it? Okay, I know what you're going to say. Material, yeah. First, raise a good pig. Yeah. Because that's where we start with everything. And <laughs> I, that's not just like a... Uh, sanctimonious nod towards well it's good for you and good for the planet it's that's not because we have some sort of ideological demand that we're trying to be consistent with Mm -hmm. or a conviction even it's because it is ineffably indisputably decisive to the deliciousness of your sausage like that is the most decisive ingredient that is if your sausage is going to taste good is going to be because it is from meat from a happy and healthy pig. Yeah. That is why. So it is is of extreme practical import. Um, and, man, if you don't have that, that is when you have to go through the torture, the torment, the agony of teasing every ounce of flavor out of the sausage and treating this meat like it is, in its raw form, this utterly insipid, bland, and boring thing. But if you are starting with meat that is already delicious, your only job is to not really screw it up. It's just, Mm -hmm. just, just salted enough. That's Mm -hmm. all it takes. And it's going to knock your socks off. So it is, it's, it's born of experience. Like the, the healthy pig part, healthy, fresh pork meat, Mm -hmm. previously frozen will work. Fresh will be superior um, because of its water holding abilities. Okay. Um, and I mean, if you have that, it's no exaggeration to say that 70% of your work is done. Mm -hmm. So I would say as to the material cause you need healthful, healthy pig Mm -hmm. that is fed well. And so organic feed really does help. Fresh feed really helps. And, um, you know, You honestly don't have to do much even on that end because the battery pigs that are raised, they are being slaughtered at four months. So usually when you buy wieners, they're two months. So two months later, industrial scale pigs are getting to 300 pounds live weight. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. You can't develop flavor in that kind of growth rate. That is so rapid or fat or sufficient fat. Yeah. But your backyard pig raised slow on a diverse diet of your food scraps and you know salubrious pig, hog mash that you purchase for them and hopefully able to root around and dig around will be more six to eight months and in, or maybe even ten and it will have more color and more fat and more saturated fat rather than oily fat and what that means is that your sausage will be delicious so that's like 70% of the battle. And the only reason I don't say 100% is because you won't taste any of that if you don't come up with the second most essential ingredient, which is salt. Right. So when I think, again, of the material constituents of sausage, it is good pork and it is 2% salt by weight. And we're tipping into the formal cause here because that's a <laughs> recipe thing. But uh-huh. I don't even know if I could consider an undersalted sausage a sausage. <laughs> if we're going to be sure. purely elitist about this, uh-huh. purely it's more just ground elitist. pork, it's a little redundant. <laughs> but so two percent by weight, I say, is the that is part of the what makes a sausage taste, because the salt in a sausage is not a seasoning; it is the mechanism of tasteitude. Mm-hmm. That is how you taste it at all, let alone a particular individual flavor. Mm-hmm. So. Two percent by weight. So that might be an update for me because mm-hmm. I know that oh, yeah. in the last few years, you've you were settling on one and a quarter teaspoon mm-hmm. to one and a half teaspoon of salt per pound right. of meat. Yeah. And so, have you kind of adjusted that now? To- that ends up. So if you do, um, that is a that's. The same quantity, it ends up being the same quantity, it's just a different measuring thing. Okay. And it's a little less precise. So, yes, it is. You know, because a teaspoon and a quarter of fine sea salt is not the same quantity of sodium chloride that uh, a teaspoon and a quarter of kosher salt is. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't work out because they have different shapes and um, 
different yeah. salinities relative to their volume. Okay. And so weight is actually the more accurate metric. Because okay. then you could say 2% salt by weight could be kosher, could be fine sea salt, could be Himalayan pink salt, could be anything. Okay. Um, if you do 2% by weight, you'll be, you'll be right there in the pocket of perfect mm -hmm. deliciousness. And you'll okay. find if you salt just by a lot of your food by hand without measuring anything mm -hmm. that's about what you salt it at yeah it's kind of the magical ratio especially yeah. when it comes to meat two percent it's right up uh at the limit but it's 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 decisively not salty it's like just perfect mm -hmm. and it also happens to be the quantity that is required the minimum to cure meat is two percent salt okay. by weight. so for convenience i would say if you want to translate that in, uh, into a volume mm -hmm. measurement, then you could say a teaspoon and a quarter per pound of meat if you're using fine sea salt. Mm -hmm. That only work. That only really works with fine sea salt, mm -hmm. and that would be on the milder end. Yeah, that might be one point eight percent salt by weight or something, mm -hmm. and then a teaspoon and a half per pound of meat would be on slightly higher end. Again, just using fine sea salt. Yeah, we. I mean, we used to do one and a half teaspoons per pound of meat for mm -hmm. us and then for some of our customers that we knew maybe were of the yeah. older generation or maybe slightly more sensitive mm -hmm. we gave them one and a quarter teaspoons per meat yeah and that was just to kind of give them a little yeah. break <laughs> right even though we we did feel that one it needed a, a full one and a half a little more yeah yeah the um so those are the first two it's good pork and sufficient quantity of salt. So pork, uh -huh. salt. And then the final, well, okay, yeah. So it doesn't have to be pork, the, the, the lean part. Right. It could be anything. I was going to say, there's also this third commandment of sausage, which is getting your lean to fat ratio. Yes, well, that's correct. the third part. I'm getting there. Okay. We're on the same wavelength. Slowly. Okay. This is an epic journey. <laughs> Uh, the it, it could be lean beef. It, it could be beef. It could be chicken. Anything. Venison. Lean flesh. You know, mm -hmm. you you want it to be of the utmost quality, for the same reasons that you I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. The third element, formal, the uh, material cause of sausage is fat, and yeah. this we do not have the luxury to um, go into different species of fat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Must be pork back fat. Yeah. Now, I think you could probably make a fine kosher sausage without pork back fat. You know, if you use the fat of a beef cow or something, I have yet to encounter such a thing. I'm not going to deny its existence, but I confess my extreme, uh, you know, doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but I am sure it's there. I, would, that's, I think it would be so cool to see what the you know the kosher deli art is of doing any cured meats without pork. Like I can't imagine it. No. So yeah. it, which it would, uh, you know you could use poultry fat, which there's plenty of in geese and duck, and I'm sure there's a lot of that going on. But that is a noble tradition about which I am perfectly ignorant. Uh -huh. And so for our purposes, I I, I just can't get away from the use of pork back fat and i would say that those are the three essential ingredients salubrious lean meat of any species two percent salt by weight pork back fat and pork back fat is the at one third of the mass by mm -hmm. the way that would be the minimum mm -hmm. a third of the weight of the sausage needs to be the subcutaneous fat of a pig and it could be some of the intermuscular fat of the pig but the majority of that third of fat should be pork back fat. Mm -hmm. And that is the fat just beneath the skin of a pig. That is the densest fat on the entire pig. And it is unique because, again, it is readily chopped by your grinder. Mm -hmm. It is not, it does not schmear, it does not turn into a grease. Uh, which other forms of fat, even pork fat, will tend to do. It stays chunky, even if the chunks are little. And mm -hmm. that is extremely important for the final texture of the sausage. Yeah. Absolutely essential. It's a ground solid. It still stays solid. Yeah, it stays but... in little little chunks. Yeah. And so it's got this slow release of lard during the cooking period. Ah, uh, right. And then it is... Um, 
So your sausage, it doesn't just run out in oil. It doesn't melt right away, mm -hmm. which the greasy, smeared fat tends to do. Mm -hmm. So essential in that regard, that would be pork back fat. And then there is a fourth material cause. Okay, well, hang on. So I just, you said a third yeah. of back fat to two-thirds of your lean meat. Mm -hmm. I have seen you go up to a half yes. in some, some sausages. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and especially... Well, you also say that, like, if you were to do a whole shoulder, yeah, depending on the pig, of course, yeah, that would give you roughly the right ratio that you'd need. Yes, which might be more like two fifths fat and three fifths <laughs> lean. You know, I mean, uh -huh. you, I don't ever see you sit there and weigh yeah. or measure these ratios. You do it by eye. That's a so. good point. I've never weighed fat in my life <laughs> uh, with any sausage ingredients. So it is very much by eye, and I would say that the the third is a is a um, oh, <laughs> slipped from my oily brain. Okay, that's uh, okay. the it's oh it's a minimum. So yes, you you, you yeah. can go up to fifty percent fat. Yeah, do in fact. <laughs> mm -hmm. The only time you might do less is with a sausage that you're intending. To ferment all the way to a state of salami. Okay. Tude. You would want more lean then. Yeah, because uh, it salami is already dry. You're cutting it and chewing this dry little stick with little chunks of fat in it, and so and a lot of the flavor in salami is in the meat. It's in the lean. Sure. Because the fat doesn't really ferment. It it doesn't it doesn't have enough water in it. It doesn't react very much, and so it's really just there for a subtle contribution of uh, sweetness moisture and, and, yeah sweetness and mm -hmm. nuttiness uh -huh. but the real intense flavors come from the lean and so you okay. can you can reduce it in a salami okay but for fresh cooked sausages and i would say definitely for sausages you intend to smoke 30 percent is the minimum yeah or you know around one third okay um i did make a you know like if you're making a boudin blanc which is a white sausage uh it's white because there's lots of white meat used you know Traditionally, it's just veal, chicken. Poultry, right. Really light colored. Even, you know, the loin from pig is very light in color. Uh -huh. You wouldn't use beef. You wouldn't use the dark belly meat or shoulder meat. You mm -hmm. would use the light colored meat. But really, it's white because it's 50% mm -hmm. fat. Mm -hmm. And you add bread crumbs with cream mm -hmm. warmed in cream mm -hmm. heavy cream and that just makes it white and it's heavily emulsified heavily ground and it's just crazy good it's yeah. so delicious largely because it's 50 percent fat yeah so a lot of times what people will do is when they're raising pigs especially if they're raising like coonies or mm -hmm. you know just real fat machines yeah you know and then they have some lean cuts but then they also have just bucket tubs of yeah. full of fat and i'm like what do i do with this yeah put it in your freezer and then when you get your deer later that winter or mm -hmm. you you have a plethora of beef or something the 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 back fat then can come out and help yes. fill out and make make a ton of sausage with yeah so that's what a lot of people do yeah especially our customers like when they get pork shares mm-hmm we do give them a whole half of a pig, which includes several slabs of this white gold in back fat. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of people end up using it for for their sausage that they'll do later that winter. How many people do you know you would say truly share your back to the land values? Or your passion for home scale craft meat curing? or simply love the multifaceted beauty of a good meal as obsessively as you do. Maybe a handful? At farmsteadmeatsmith.com, we've created an online community of hundreds of omnivores from around the world and a platform for them to learn from and inspire one another. In addition to our major semi-annual hands-on educational event, The Family Pig, here at our Pacific Northwest homestead, over at farmsteadmeetsmith.com, we host a purely digital membership program with an archive of film and textual resources years deep now for you to dive deeper into your food journey with. And both our classes and online program include access to our private community Facebook page for your continued education and fellowship. 
We've been told that our classes are life-changing and the membership program unparalleled in quality and quantity. To get a taste of our education, search farmsteadmeetsmith.com and our YouTube channel for our free films, conversations, and downloads. Explore how we and other meatsmiths across the globe may best come alongside you, putting the knife in your hand, article by article, and comment thread by comment thread, and can support you in building your home around the harvest. Please head to farmsteadmeatsmith.com today. I think the fourth material cause of sausage is casing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I uh-huh. mean, it doesn't have to be. You know, there's obviously such thing as bulk sausage. There's even such a thing as bulk sausage that, has, that can be fermented. A little patty, I've done it. It ferments beautifully, wonderfully. It's awesome. Um, but for some reason, we have been stuffing the ground meat into the intestines of the pig and the cow and the lamb Mm -hmm. for a little tiny breakfast sausages and so you know some maybe the fourth material causes the you know some sort of form it's a mold you can bake your sausage in a tureen you can shape it by stuffing it into a casing and then poaching it or frying it or something Uh, but there's some sort of form that is put on this incredibly malleable shapeable ground mass of Mm -hmm. seasoned pork and it's usually the intestines, the mm-hmm. small intestine of a pig, which is a genius thing. I can't imagine how that was arrived at, mm-hmm. to, to use the pig's own guts to store the meat from the same pig. Mm-hmm. And to let it hang around for a while until it gets dry and then cut into it and just go to town. Uh, really, really amazing. And so definitely natural casings. The, I've never used them, the cellulose ca- casings, the, the synthetic ones that are made, but I assume that they have a candy wrapper-like quality, which would be very off-putting for me. There's not, the, I mean, nothing quite like the, the snap of the actual small intestine of a pig. Uh-huh. It's so delicious. And it's really the, it's the small intestine with, that has been removed from the mesentery which is kind of like this fatty sheath in which it is cased and that's you just pull it out of that it's kind of simple it slides right out as the mesentery remains behind and then you work the inside clean by pressing and extruding the pink mucosal inner lining and then you are left with a clear casing that mm-hmm. you can see through. Mm-hmm. And those, I would say, are the essential ingredients. And it's not for nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's good pork, salt, fat, casing, or some sort of, sort of form. And if you get those, you don't have to um, accumulate a ton of very complex recipes with esoteric ingredients and obsess over the exact and precise measurements of each one and ratios. If you did nothing but slaughter a healthy pig, grind its flesh and salt it 2% by weight and put it in a casing and fry it up, call it good. Mm -hmm. That will, I am 90% certain that will be, well I'd say in 90% of the cases, (laughs) that will be the most delicious sausage you've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. guarantee it 90 percent of you (laughs) it really will yeah it's just shockingly good Uh it's stupidly good Uh it's better than it ought yeah it exceeds your input um even though you'll be exhausted from scraping your pig but well it's kind of like when you talk about material cause i mean that's that's aristotelian language so Mm -hmm. we're talking about the essence of a thing yeah and the matter we're we moderns are really good with messing those things up <laughs> in so many ways, and you've heard us harp on uh, one of them. I'll I'll go into it again, but beer. Yeah, uh-huh. we are so good at going. Well, they did it right for centuries, but <laughs> I think I know better. Let's put some <laughs> lavender in this beer <laughs> or something, you know. And I can just see that. I have I have seen some modern uh mm-hmm. you know um new fashion kind of delis put mm-hmm. some crazy stuff in sausage yeah to, for effect for for i don't know i guess it has a little firework 
kind of mm-hmm. effect. Um, but it can be you're messing. Fun. You're yeah. It's it's fun. Mm-hmm. That, that's a, that word needs to be analyzed a little. But yeah. So which means it's superfluous. Okay. The I think that the best sausage ingredients are the ones that are like even spicing profiles. They are a reaction. They serve two purposes. It's not just fun. It's not just superfluous. It's not just what ratio sounds good or tastes good. They they also have some sort of pragmatic reason for being in the sausage. Mm-hmm. Like um, you can think of salami as a great example of this. Garlic is delicious. Mm-hmm. So is rosemary. They also have some antibacterial qualities. Uh-huh. Wine is delicious. You pour it into sausage and it sours it a little bit. Also, it increases the acidity of the sausage. Even just mixing ground meat that has salt added to it binds water. And so the salt itself has dual functions. Tastes great. Totally Mm -hmm. decadent. But also of utter practical worth. I mean, if you didn't have salt in a sausage, it would go bad very quickly and make you very sick. Yeah. And so it, all of these, when these spices have two purposes, that's uh, sublime. Yeah. That's like, wait, you mean this makes the sausage work, makes it safe and yeah. delicious? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. So there's just so much more uh, to be gained that way. Yeah. Well, it's just, that's why it's, stood the test of time right it's not like doritos yeah like doritos are going to go out of fashion Mm -hmm. because they have that fun factor but they don't i mean the function is just not there yeah they make you feel (laughs) they make people fat make you feel like a big greasy dorito yeah (laughs) yeah so i i think that that those pragmatic elements they're not they're not irrelevant and i i don't know i want some like I don't know what it would be, a culinary biologist to do a study on how our tastes have been shaped by the ingredients that we have selected, maybe originally for practical purposes. Yeah. And then we came to, through several generations, think, uh, yeah, you put rosemary with lamb. Yeah. That's what you do <laughs> because it's delicious. Uh-huh. Um, I'm sure there was some other practical practical purpose like even rosemary has this other incredible effect is that it is an antioxidant so it really helps fats not go rancid right which lamb can be known for it can happen Uh it's 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 a weird rancidity especially Mm -hmm. if you don't have refrigeration and it's the lamb is hanging out for a while you'll get this greasy thing going on Mm -hmm. that is bitter um and counteract that Mm -hmm. with a nice rosemary marinade or cure or rub or something Mm -hmm. so even now, they're starting to extract the oils of rosemary that you can anoint your prosciutto with or something to, to a minor extent, inhibit oh, wow. rancidification. That's neat. Um, okay, so real quick, before, because I wanted to maybe, for the second part of the podcast, because we've been kind of dividing these up into one and mm-hmm. two parts, um, so I wanted to get to you taking us through the process of how you make sausage. Okay. Um, but before then, I wanted to do a little... Well, a couple things. Go back to the fourth material cause. Yeah. I am going to throw in a little monkey wrench, okay? Yeah. But I, I want to make an argument that it's not one of these modern <laughs> monkey wrenches. Because <laughs> I, okay. I will not contradict myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never do that. No. But you did do an experiment, and I think there is some historical basis for an uncased sausage. Yeah. Uh, and I remember you tested it maybe last winter. Mm-hmm. You made like a patty out of raw mm-hmm. sausage mix, and then you had it kind of dry out here on this shelf. I put it on the shelf right there. <laughs> that we're recording on our, top of yeah. a coffee filter. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Highly scientific. Yeah. Um, and sanitary and mm-hmm. all that. Um, but it worked. Yeah. It Actually, did. one time it worked. One time it didn't work. Yeah. But one the one time it well a lot of it is the weather. It's just the climate. The, yeah. Stuff. The first yeah. time we had the right climate. The second time we didn't. But it developed this beautiful like penicillin. Okay, I'm stealing your thunder it here. Did. Go no, ahead no. and tell us what happened. But it was like cheese. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was perfect. It worked really well. Got the penicillin mold, which is kind of an indication of a low pH, which which is to say high acidity, which is what you want. Yeah. And um. Yeah, it worked. It worked really well. I mean, we sliced into it. It was fully equalized and yeah. dry, and yeah, it was delicious. I think uh, in France they call them 
I don't know how to say it, but the beret, like like a like a beret, that kind of, kind of style hat. Oh, uh, yeah, that's what it looked like. Yeah, so it's it is part of I think um, you know the cooler climbs in France, northern mountainous but regions that does have made have... that kind of salami. Okay, so that does have a tradition behind yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that legitimizes it in my mind <laughs> <laughs> because it's lasted, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so like farmers markets, you would see them. Yeah. I think abundantly like people do this yeah it's a thing mm -hmm. yeah it's not just brandon being like eccentric no it is a thing yeah yeah Maybe take us through how you make a sausage. Okay. You know. I am the efficient keep, cause. Keeping in mind. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keeping in mind the healthy pig, the sharp knives, you know, like some of these basic principles. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that the, you know, you need to kill a pig. And um, it is worthwhile getting the scald and scrape because that is going to maximize your harvest of back fat. Okay. Right. Because a pig, we've talked about this before, there's no seam, no apparent clear seam between the skin of the pig and its flesh. Unlike a hided animal like a rabbit or a deer or everything else, where you can pull the hide off sort of like a giant wet sock. You mm -hmm. can pull it off. Not going to happen on a pig. Mm -hmm. It has skin like us. And so it is. it does not just pull off of the flesh you would have to knife it off almost every single inch of it and if you're not going to knife it off and your knife is sort of dull um if you, well i should say if you're not going to uh cut the the skin off right where it meets the fat mm -hmm. and your knife is dull it's likely to fall into the nearest seam right the path of least resistance which is the seam that separates not skin from fat but back fat from the rest of the fat on the pig within the subcutaneous fat under the skin of a pig and just on top of its musculature there are two kinds of fat mm -hmm. and the, i think you showed it the, in a recent podcast. yeah we did yeah. okay yeah so it's the stuff just under the skin and your knife will fall into that seam more often than not at least a humongous proportion of a pig of a pig's back fat will be removed upon the skinning of that pig mm -hmm. which is horrible so horrible it's very sad because that's the it, that is the primary fat that you need um so scald and scrape your pig i would say and then the other thing if uh is like you mentioned earlier i've never weighed fat in my life i just grind the shoulder or the sirloin so and this is again for like a moderately fatty pig which bat i would say most backyard pigs especially if people have sourced heritage breeds are moderately fatty it, uh, if you have sourced a lard pig such as a cooney cooney or an american guinea hog and you've let them grow beyond eight to ten months which you ought because they're very slow grazers mm -hmm. or slow growers if you let them go beyond that, they, they are not moderately fat. They are um, luxuriously fat. <laughs> yeah. In which case, this might not quite apply. But for moderately fat pigs, you can safely skin the shoulder. You know, this is at the butchery time. Yeah. Cut the skin off of the shoulder and take all the bones out and then just grind the entire shoulder. And not worry about weighing out how much fat do I have? Is there enough to lean? It will be enough. Um, you can just look at it too and ask yourself, self, is there enough white in there? <laughs> and if it looks like there's at least a third, uh -huh. the answer is yes. Yeah. So, um, and that is the same with the sirloin, which is the region around the pelvis. So the shoulder, the, and that could be just the Boston or just the picnic or both. And the whole pelvis, grind them. Yeah. The whole thing, don't even worry about it. Yeah. You'll have enough fat mm -hmm. with a moderately fatty healthy backyard pig mm -hmm. um and there you've got everything settled i mean there's the quality and the quantity of the fat mm -hmm. sorted Good. and so i that's the first step bone out grind everything 
and this is for a fresh sausage and then uh, you can grind it on a coarse or a finer plate totally a matter of taste what your goals for the sausage are weigh the ground mass salt it at two percent by weight mix it again to your desired consistency and that could be dependent upon a matter of taste or what your if you're going to ferment it what your goals are but usually you mix it until you achieve this condition called the myosin conversion mm -hmm. whereby the friction of your hands sort of triggers this enzyme in that's already in the muscle with the combination of the uh, maybe with the salt and other acidifying ingredients begins to break down the protein binders yes. and the longer you grind it the more pasty it will become okay it will you can take it all the way to a fully emulsified sausage um, if you can keep it cool enough which okay. is not that hard again with <laughs> Excuse me. Not that hard with healthy pork. Mm -hmm. With nasty pork, with lots of oily fat that has a lower melting point, mm -hmm. that is very difficult. You have to like use a bowl chopper and throw little bits of ice in there regularly. Mm -hmm. But with really good pork, you can your arms will fall off before you get to the fully emulsified state. Mm -hmm. But and even then, it's not really emulsification. But mm -hmm. <laughs> it's homogenized like a hot dog. Uh -huh. You cut it, you don't see chunks. Yeah, you see one yeah. color. That's, emuls that's emulsified. And yeah. you might like a more chunky sausage, in which case you would mix it just enough to disperse spices and salt. Or you might like a snappy hot dog style sausage, in mm -hmm. which case you, you just mix it much longer mm -hmm. and maybe grind it through a finer grind, maybe even grind it twice um, to achieve that emulsified state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the stringies and the clingies. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, and so we've had, this applies to like, if you're making a pate mix, which is the same yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like we've had people ask us, I'm making the pate and it just, it's just turning out crumbly. Mm -hmm. And it's probably because they aren't, you know, they're mixing like you'd mix, I don't know, like pancakes. And we've all been kind of trained when you're mixing for baking, don't mix too much. Yeah. Just barely get it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're trying to achieve this this uh, meat myosin conversion, you really have to work at it for a while. Yeah, yeah. And it is evident by the stringies and clingies. Yeah. So the meat will become pasty because it's coming out of the grinder in little wormies, right? Yeah. Because it's not smearing. Yes. So that's, I should mention, that's how you know it's not smearing. If it's extruding from your grinder out the edges of the plate with holes in it, in a gray paste, uh -huh. you're getting schmear. Uh -huh. Not so good. Yeah. If it's coming out as individual long stringies, <laughs> very good. Yeah. And frequently, uh, we mentioned, you know, you're likely to get schmear if you have pork that is uh, overly oily and not very healthy going in. It'll be paste coming out of the grinder. But there's also to be considered the relative quality of grinders. So it really needs to be machined well, such that the blade that rotates at the end of the uh, corkscrew, you know, mm -hmm. is right up against the plate with holes in it. Yeah. On it. Yeah. You and know. Yeah. We have a and particular that, that grinder. that takes some yeah. machining, right? Uh -huh. So it, it takes quality. Mm -hmm. Crappy ones, uh, there's play there. And so there'll be some space. Yeah. Which means you will have schmear even in the case of healthy pork because uh -huh. it's not going to be cutting the meat at all. It's just going to be like stretching it and smearing it and it's real bad. So quality grinder. We've got, mm -hmm. I think they call it, we don't always, Pro Cut Pro is Cut. the brand it's the that name. it's called now. Yeah. And that is the grinder you see behind me. Uh -huh. That's it, that little box right well, there. Well, that says Torre probably. It says Torre, yeah. which is what it used to be called, but it's the same <laughs> thing. This is the smallest one they sell. Okay. Three quarter horse. It's a little guy. It's that's not a home domestic one. Yeah, yeah. but we have used it for ten years. I yeah. mean, it's the one. Yeah, it's been leaking oil for six. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> should probably take care of that. I fried it once, and it came back to life. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, billowing smoke, horrible burnt plastic <laughs> smell. Flipped right back on the next day. So big yeah. fans of the little Torre. Yeah, um, we have all of our sausage tool kit outlined inside our membership as well yes. so that's another little yeah yeah check out there for the, the the stuffer the pricker the yeah even the casings where we get them all of that stuff is inside membership oh yeah but i was going to describe the stringies and the clingies so okay, when yeah. you get that emulsification which is more of a suspension i think accurately so called because uh -huh. it's little bits of protein surrounding fat molecules 
they're not actually homogenizing. Okay. But uh huh. That is neither here nor there. No, that's what yeah. is important is the stringies and the clingies, right. which you see and feel like you'll it, it will be clinging to you. It'll be pasting and sticking to your hands. And when you pull, you grab a ball of it and you pull it apart with your two hands, you'll see little stringies. It is transforming before yeah. your eyes. Mm-hmm. You can feel the transformation. Yeah. And again, how much you do that is a matter of personal taste. Uh-huh. If you intend to ferment the sausage, you're going to want to bind as much water as you can. And the binding of the water, the available water, happens the more you mix it. Yeah. The proteins break down and they bind water. Um, mm-hmm. And... Uh, there goes our Instagram. Yeah. Page. Well, it said it ended because there was a bad connection. So, oh. you know, we might be able to set Let it up. Let me take again. a brief pause here. We're okay. halfway through our. Because uh, I wanted to talk about um, what we've been doing lately. Our Instagram audience has been invited to f- watch these podcast mm-hmm. recordings. Um, we're actually doing some fun stuff on Instagram lately, mm-hmm. some giveaways and things. So, I wanted to remind you to, if you're on Instagram, follow us there. Um, also, if you are part of our membership program, we I have a Facebook feed on right now, and I actually I wanted to invite anyone who's got some sausage questions, please send them our way. Um, as as being a member, it's sort of a new thing we've developed mm-hmm. is is recording these podcasts through Facebook Live on our private Facebook page, and um, that's that's you know part of what you get as a member and. By the way, membership is open right now. So Mm -hmm. um, membership is open through the holiday season, and uh, we wanted to invite you to to become a member. And one of the things is is the invitation to send us some questions on the topic that we're recording live. Yeah, so I'll tell the community manager to (laughs) send out emails before podcasts to our members, uh, meets with members. (laughs) Yes. To uh, notify them of the topic and the time when they... Can, they can be here watching live as we record, yeah. submitting questions pertaining to yeah. that topic. Yeah. Um, we're trying to get more on top of our community manager yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be. If only he you. would get his. <laughs> stuff it's okay. Together. He's my advertising agency and, uh, yeah, but you're full time. It's, it's harvest season. It is. I was See, gonna say that. Yeah, we're a little. Proof, we're a little. I have fried right now. <laughs> I have bacon and ham on the table, or no, ha- ham and hocks yeah. behind us. Yeah. Oh, with wine. You brought the wine. I brought the port to warm us up. Yeah. It is. It's just chilly. It is December. It is. I'm in like my wool right now. So <laughs> we should probably should we take a break, pour some port, and I should go stoke the smoker so it can keep going. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This conversation will be continued in a forthcoming part two episode. Thanks for listening and peace be with you.